There's five games. On Thursday, we're going to talk about them. We're going to look at stream options, and we're going to revel in the mysteries of the NBA injury reports. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and unfortunately I'm doubtful with a hamstring strain. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by Fangio. Make every moment more. Right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That is $150 bucks in Win or lose, visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and we are available on all platforms. So double bang, hit that thumb, drop that all down in the comments below. We are here to talk, as Obi pops his head up, we are here to talk about Thursday's action, the last real streaming day of the season. There are five games on, of course, we move into 15 games on Friday and then 15 games on Sunday, which you still might be able to stream depending on what happens to your roster. For example, if you still have Jaron Jackson, where you go and drop him because he's not playing again this season. Um, there are certain options of guys that you'll be able to move on from who you feel okay are going to sit these games and then you can get somebody else in who's on the waiver wire, whose value might boost for a single game. We know that. We just don't know who those guys, guys are going to be at this point. But this one's an easy one. With five games on, you're going to have open active roster spots that you can fill to get some extra games in for this week. Let's talk about the games as best we can. I'm not going to tell you about the team's schedules because every single one of these teams that we talk about today plays Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. That is it. There's no no differences in schedules for anybody anymore. The first game, we're talking Chicago. We're talking Detroit. Um, Andre Drummond sprained his ankle last game. The Bulls are officially listing him doubtful. That seems optimistic, to be fair. Like I, the way that he left that game, there's he's not playing. Like, this, what are we talking about? I don't think he's playing Friday, Sunday either. Um, but at the moment, he's officially doubtful. Ayo Dusumu missed the last game for Chicago. He's questionable here. Alex Caruso played, but he is probable. Julian Phillips remains out. I said that Cade Cunningham is out. The Pistons lied and said that he is questionable for injury management. Remember, the last time that he was announced as ready to play, he got scratched five minutes after official tip-off time for injury management. Has not played since. That's four games out. What a weird injury management plan this is, i.e. terrible franchise and tanking. And that's fine. He shouldn't play. There's no reason for him to play after suffering that knee injury a few months ago. He doesn't need to play, but they lie to us continually. So yeah, Cade is officially questionable. I would... Maybe he plays. Maybe he does. I'd be very surprised if he does. But because he's listed as questionable, i got to tell you that maybe he plays. And we did get confirmation. This is of Tosan Ebuwan, who's been in the G League the last two games. Now, of course, the G League aren't playing. There's only two teams left in the G League. It's Maine and Oklahoma City. Um, they're in the finals. But Tosan doesn't have enough games left on his two-way contract, so he has to get listed in the G League and not available to play. So that's three games in a row. I'm not actually sure if he's got any games left, not that we're rostering him. Javante Green, we need to watch. He's been playing pretty good minutes. I, I'm not certain that he's a must roster, but honestly, with five games on, he's going to be in the rotation. Plus, he's got 30-minute upside. I think you've got to use him here. For the Pistons, I do want to watch Jalen Duran for a couple of reasons. A, they don't give him 30 minutes anymore. It's like 27 minutes as they, of course, tank. But it's more about watching what Duran can become next season. I've been very disappointed with Duran from a defensive real-life perspective. He doesn't contest any shots. He doesn't block any shots. Yeah, he puts up great rebounds. He shows some flashing of passing. But in terms of is he a center of the future, I'm still not 100% there with it. So that's mainly what I want to watch. In terms of guys getting boosted, I do have Vucevic there. Now, of course, Vuce is going to be rostered in every league. But with Drummond out, you're going to see a lot of numbers bump up there. And there's no backup center. Unless you're a big fan of Adama Sonogo, you're going to get a lot of Vuce in this one. Um, and then Shemezi Metu with no Ebon Wan. Metu has been starting the last couple. He should start again. Now, he didn't bring any defensive stats in the last game. But that doesn't mean that that'll be the case in every single one of these. The Knicks... And the Celtics is the next game up. Um, 
the Celtics, they're obviously way ahead of everybody else. So we're going to get these injury reports all the way through. They have listed officially Jalen Brown, Drew Holiday, Al Horford, Jason Tatum, Christos Porzingis, and Xavier Tillman as questionable. So Derek White is the only one who is safe. I would be absolutely stunned if Drew Holiday plays in this game. Stunned. I would be surprised if Porzingis and Horford um, didn't play, but I don't know because this is the first of a back-to-back and there, I can guarantee you that Porzingis and Horford are not playing in both of these. So Brown, Holiday, Horford, Tatum, Porzingis, they are playing one out of the next two games. Porzingis and Horford missed the last one. So I would say that maybe one of them plays here, but I don't know. You are going to have out of those five names, again, Derek might not include it, out of those five ga- names, two to three guys will be out and one of them almost definitely will be Drew Holiday is my guess. Tillman started last game with Porzingis and Horford out, and he's also questionable. So you could get a scenario where Luke Cornett has to log a lot of minutes. The other thing to pay attention to with the Celtics, like I said with the G League, is they can't call up J.D. Davison or Nemeas Kader or Jordan Walsh or these guys, um, Drew Peterson, because they're playing in the G League finals. And game two is on the 11th. And game three, which I don't know why the NBA did this, game three is the 15th after the NBA regular season is over. So we might be in a situation where the Celtics want to sit everybody, but they can't call up a bunch of guys. Meaning that like, you know, Shea Brissett and uh, Svima Luke and those sort of players have to play 35 minutes in one of these games moving forward. For the Knicks, well, the only guy's out is Julius Randle. Everyone else is ready to go. Josh Hart played 46 minutes, which is literally insane last game. We'll see if they do that again here. But his value is obviously high. And then I do think that Sam Hauser and Peyton Pritchard are going to get pretty big boosts on this Celtics team because people are going to be out. And then Hartenstein gets that boost because they took Precious Achua out of the rotation completely for the uh, Knicks last game. So it's Achua. Oh, sorry, it's uh, Hartenstein and Robinson who are getting all, all of those center minutes. Third game of the day is the Rockets. They are taking on the Utah Jazz men. Um, all right. Just having a look to see if there's any updates on injuries for this one. There is not at this point, which is frustrating. What we do know is that Shingun is not returning this season. Jay Sean Tate is not returning this season. And for the Jazz, let's be fair, John Collins isn't playing this season. Jordan Clarkson isn't playing this season. I They're, they're the ones I feel good about, but they haven't told us that. I don't think that Walker Kessler is going to play with that nasal fracture. I'm going to list him doubtful. I am very certain that Chris Dunn is not going to play. He's missed the last couple with a foot injury. The one that I'm really sort of on the fence with is Colin Sexton, who was a late scratch yesterday with an illness. It does appear that Sexton will work to get back, and he won't be on the we are trying to lose 17 games in a row plan like they are with everybody else. So watch Sexton. With Sexton out, a lot more usage goes to Taylor Horton Tucker, and then he becomes viable. But the Sexton one, I think, is real in terms of whether he's truly questionable. These other blokes, almost no shot. I don't think of them playing. And I don't believe there's been any real update on those guys. Yep, no, of course there has not. So Jalen Green's what I want to watch in Houston. He had that real big stretch of production and then has fallen off again. The good thing I'd say with Jalen is he's been able to maintain the assists bump, which has been strong, but it's all about efficiency here from him, and that has really fallen away. And then for the Jazz, finally, we got a big Omer Yurtseven game. Now, in a couple of those games that he started in place of Kessler, he played like 20 minutes, and they went to Darius Baisley, which is disgusting, but they did it. But we also saw that if we get 30 minutes of Yurtseven, that he is a really useful fantasy option. In terms of guys getting boosted, Dylan Brooks is getting more shots, and that's What's happening? Um, and then we saw Luka Sharmanic start for the Jazz last game. He had a double-double. If this man plays 35 minutes, you use him. I don't know whether he's going to start over Sensible or not, but if he does, then we stream him in. Now, he barely played prior to that game, so it's hard to judge, but I'm in on Sharmanic, at least in that sort of a sense. The other thing to watch is going to be Amin Thompson, who played big minutes last game because Cam Whitmore was ejected. Will Amin play 30 minutes if Whitmore is available? We just, at this point, we just don't know that. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Do you ever wonder what adventure could be just around the next corner? Well, our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. It's got class-exclusive Google built in, which is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. 
The 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. Nissan's incredible lineup also includes the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder. It's got room for up to eight, an expansive cargo capacity, and advanced available 4x4 capabilities. With 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds of towing, when adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. So take the Nissan Pathfinder, the Nissan Rogue, or the Nissan Armada, and go and find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. All right, let's look at the next game. It is the Pelicans and the Sacramento Kings. And at the moment, we're okay here. Like injury-wise, there's nothing super um, interesting. The Kings are still in a sort of a battle because the Lakers are coming up behind them. They need to stay ahead of the Lakers and the Warriors in order to maintain um, that eight seed, which gives them the double chance in the play-in scenario. They're also a game behind the King, or the Suns for the seven, which I don't think they can get to. And they were two games behind the six, so that, that which is the Pelicans. But of course, if you beat the Pelicans then that's a win for you, a loss for them. That's a double, right? That's that's big, big. So like at the moment, the Kings are 45 and 34. They can go to 46 and 34, and then the Pelicans go 47 and 33, really putting you a lot closer, which then can you know, maybe shake things up, although the Pelicans have killed the Kings, I believe, every game this season. Regardless, this should be a pretty strong um, contest with you know, a little bit to play for here. In terms of the injuries, well, the big one is going to be Brandon Ingram. I don't think he's going to be back here, but it wouldn't surprise me. It sounds like he is getting ready to return, much like Trey Young returning on Wednesday, much like Carl Anthony Towns potentially returning on Sunday before the end of the regular season. So Ingram could be back. I would think he's more likely back Friday. Even if he plays Thursday, he won't play Friday. But at the moment, I'm listing Ingram as doubtful. Najee Marshall has also missed the last couple. I'll list him questionable. Last game for Sacramento, Keegan Murray was on the injury report as a questionable tag with his calf. Again, he played through it. He played big minutes. So don't be shocked if you do see him appear on the injury report. But he also is more likely to play, given, again, that they are trying to get those uh, those victories. Dyson Daniels is playing really well at the moment. He's out playing uh, Jose Alvarado. And if Marshall is out, there's big opportunities here for Daniels to play 27 minutes to get five assists, five rebounds, two steals. That might have use. Like the minutes are really interesting for Dyson at the moment. On the King side of things, it is Keegan Murray. It's not about like whether you use him, you do, but you know, minutes. But can we get any level of consistency with this bloke in usage and in efficiency? I would say that he has been. He's been like, how much has he improved from his rookie season? He has a little bit, but I wouldn't say that he's taken the steps forward consistently enough. So we just keep an eye on that. In terms of the guys that get boosted, while with Ingram likely out, we're getting a lot more out of Ken Murphy. We're getting a lot more out of Herb Jones and, of course, Dyson Daniels. And then we saw it last game from Keon Ellis. You hit a couple of shots early. Mike Brown leans in. You play 36 minutes. You deliver an absolute gem. You come out and you go 0 for 3 next game. You play 19 minutes. You have zero points with one rebound and two assists, and you're completely useless. So the Keon Ellis scenario, which we've said for the last two weeks, when Herder went down and when, when Monk went down, it's an investment because the game-to-game -game is going to be wild. It's going to be all over the shop. So you've got to almost deal with the bad to get the good, and you can't pick when the bad or the good is going to come. We just know that at least he has the opportunity. Not like Colby Jones, not like Chris Duarte, not like Davion Mitchell. Keon Ellis has the opportunity because he does begin in the starting lineup, meaning that if things go well, then it's good. But the others get the opportunity if Ellis sucks. So that does put that in uh, an advantage situation for him. The fifth game of the day, we're talking Warriors and the Blazers. John Kaminga, very low minutes in the last game. Um, that's a concern. But what we need, also need to watch is the rest scenario, which I don't know why I jumped to Kaminga, and I shouldn't have. I want to tell you that I do think we have to have a level of concern about Steph, Draymond, Clay, Chris Paul. I don't think that they rest because, like we talked about with the Kings, the Warriors are currently in the 10th seed. They've made the play-in, but they're a half game behind the Lakers. They are one game behind the Kings. The Kings lose, the Warriors win. They can jump into the eight, especially if the Lakers lose. So... They need to keep winning. Now, this is an easy game, though. And they play again on Friday. So how do you prioritize resting these guys, making sure they're healthy? Or you know, can you get the win if one or two guys are out? That's a tough call. So I'm not going to rule them out. But I think we've got to be on a watch to say whether Draymond, Clay, Paul, or Curry plays first game back-to-back -back against a team that is trying to lose. Dario Saric has also missed the last couple of games with a knee issue. And of course... We have to tell you that Jeremy Grant is almost definitely going to be listed as doubtful. That's not official yet, 
but it gets pretty close to being official. Let's see, is there any official? No, no, no. He's still not officially doubtful. I'm sure he will be. And Simons and Thibel and Brogdon, who have not been ruled out for the season, will be out for the season. We do want to watch Kaminga because he's coming off the bench behind Jackson Davis and Draymond and played 21 minutes last game. Now, with only five games on, of course, we use him. But then if he does that again, is that worth it on Fridays and Sundays? I don't know. Maybe not. For Portland, DeAndre Aiden, the snowman. This guy is shoveling up some big numbers at the moment. He is uh, hes definitely not sleeping his way through the end of the regular season. These are big, big numbers from Aiden. Is he, he's the only good player left on this team, and he's taking full advantage of it. We'll see what this translates to for the end, for next season, but it's been good to see. And then I think there is a chance for Pajemski to get a boost because there's a chance that Steph or Draymond or Clay or Chris Paul is out, which does give you a couple of extra minutes for Pajemski. And again, he's probably got a 20-minute floor here with only five games on. That does become useful. And then in Portland, now this guy is going to be inefficient, but Jabari Walker does have 18 rebound upside. He could be your, he's going to be the starting power forward. He could play 40 minutes. He could have 10 points on 13 shots, but he could also grab 18 rebounds and maybe sneak a block in there. He's very, very up and down. We know this in terms of that inefficiency coming from a big man spot, but the rebounds and the role, again, unless Jeremy Grant has a miraculous recovery and decides he's going to play his first April game in four years, that Walker is going to get a lot of minutes there as the team's starting power forward. Let's um, let's talk streaming. Let's go to points leagues first here, and let's go to Yahoo points leagues and have a look at some options for streaming. Again, the bold, no, the capitalized names are more your shallow formats. They're 40% plus available. Your italicized names are 70% plus available. And anyone who's got neither of those um, textual flourishes is uh, 50% plus available. So Keontae George and Scoot Henderson, Yes, there are massive efficiency problems with both of these guys, but they are still 40 plus percent available. So if you're in an eight team or a 10 team Yahoo, they might be there. And given that there's only five games on and we're talking points league stuff, they've got to be added if they're somehow available. And then there's a bunch of like lowly rostered players from these bad teams opening opportunities. Opportunities Now there is risk with the Jabari Walker. There's risk with Omer Yurtseven. What if they decide to go with Micah Potter or Darius Baisley or they chuck out Ken Lofton? Like anything can happen with that team. But the opportunities are there. James Wiseman, I've also got on that list because they have been keeping Duran to 27 minutes. I would love it if we could get 29 minutes of Wiseman because then we would really get into using him as an option here. But at the moment, that's not what we're expecting. And then Taylor Hendricks has been bad, but there is going to be like a game where he has 15, 16 points coming up here. He's starting. The opportunity's there. He hasn't delivered. But at some point, I hope, I hope at some point we get something. For ESPN Points Leagues. Some similar names. We've got Scoot Henderson, Delano Banton there at the top. Um, well, I didn't talk Banton before. Banton should just be rostered everywhere, um, realistically. Yeah, he can have some real stinkers, but he should be rostered everywhere. I've got Wiseman, Walker. There's Peyton Pritchard, whose value does change significantly. I don't expect the Drew Holiday plays, and that would really help Peyton Pritchard. But if Drew does play, we saw last game that Pritchard didn't do a huge amount in that one, and that does limit his production. But I, I do think he'll be okay to use. And then you've got Omer Yurtsev. But it is always risky, but we just want guys who play with only 10 teams active and a lot of nonsense going on basically all around the league with injury reports. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. It is playoff time in the NBA and in the NHL. Baseball season is up and running, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That is $150, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. And don't forget to gamble responsibly. So let's look at some category league stream options. We'll go to points, the category, the points category. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, Again, I do think that streaming in for points, you do look to Scoot. You do look to Keontae, Keontae George. Yes, there are the big downsides of field goal percentage, but if they are available, we go that way. Sam Hauser and James Wiseman, I do think, are options for the points category as well. Now, the Hauser one depends on somebody in Boston resting, and somebody will rest. Guaranteed that the load managers will sit somebody down. Wiseman, again, that's trying to look at the pattern of where Jalen Duran's minutes have been, meaning that Wiseman can play 21-22. Dylan Brooks is getting a lot of shots. Whether they go in or not is always anybody's guess, but they're not easing back on what he's doing. So like, I think he's an option there. And so is Peyton Pritchard, who's widely available in that points category. 
For threes, some similar names. Slam and Sammy Hauser right up the top. Keontae George is there. Peyton Pritchard is there. Pritchard and Hauser are going to have pretty strong roles the remaining three games here for Boston. It's just trying to figure out which one is the bigger ones versus the smaller ones, but it doesn't really matter. You just have them at this stage. Dylan Brooks also hit some threes. And then I've got Al Horford on this list. I expect that Horford plays, but I also don't know because this is the first of a back-to-back. He sat the last one. Does he sit two in a row? Do they just sit everybody in the game on Friday? It's totally possible, but I don't know. And then Trey Lyles. He's getting a lot of run. He's playing over Harrison Barnes at times, and he does hit threes. So again, we're not talking about huge, huge upside guys that the Hauser is. Even George's, they can go six or seven triples. Even Pritchard can do that. But the other guys, a nice two to three sort of three-point upside level in a uh, lower volume day. For rebounds, we'll get into the big man stats now. We've got Jabari Walker, who is like an 18 rebound upside player. Omar Yurtseven's a double-digit rebound player as well. And then we go to James Wiseman and Luka Shamanich. Now, Shamanich showed last game he could do double digits. He played 35 minutes, he started. I don't know whether he starts over Sensibor again, but we're in the mix there. I've got Hendricks as a rebound guy, and then there is James Wiseman who can pull down seven or eight, even in a backup role. And then if he is available in your league, I do like getting Trace Jackson Davis, even though he might play 24 or 25 minutes, seven or eight rebounds, including pushing up to double digits. It's definitely a possibility. If we look at the blocks category, Jackson Davis is probably the guy I like the most there. He can get four blocks in 20 minutes. That is possible. We love that upside in him. Then we go Hendricks, Baisley, and Yurt7 all in Utah, just with the likelihood that there's no Collins, there's definitely no Markinen, there's likely no Kessler, these guys are going to have to play sizable roles, and they're all pretty good permanent shot blockers. And then James Wiseman's name comes up again, as does Al Horford. Again, I don't know whether he is going to play or not, but there is an opportunity there for Horford to come in. He can block one or two shots, he can play some extra minutes, and then sit the last two games. That is a possibility for him, but it is, of course, risky. The last big man number we're going to look at here is field goal percentage. I feel the most comfortable about Chase Jackson Davis, even though last game I think he only had 40% shooting. Um, Wiseman's there. Javante Green, not really a big man, but he is playing power forward for the Bulls. He is a high efficiency field goal guy. You've got Mitch Robinson, who is only getting those backup minutes behind Hartenstein. Yes, Stephen A. Smith. Robinson is the backup. Um, but he could easily go 4 or 4, and that's great. It's a really good boost for your field goal percentage. Alex Len also gets his 12 minutes, 2 of 2, 3 of 3, 2 of 3. Enough there just to give you a little bit of a boost in that category. And then Shemezi Metu usually is a pretty good field goal percentage player. Then we go to the guard stats for assists. We go to those two rookie guards, Scoot Henderson, Keontae George. Scoot dropped double digits last game. He is way higher assist upside than Keontae George. But they're both going to play a lot of minutes and have the ball in their hands a lot. Then it gets very iffy. My next highest guy is probably Marcus Sasser. Again, assuming that Kate is out and Sasser starts, he's been pretty bad though, Marcus Sasser. But five or six assists can come. Then it's Peyton Pritchard. Again, if Drew is out, I really like him. If Drew is and Derek White are in, I'm less interested. I do think Drew sits, so that boosts Pritchard up here. And then, yeah, you get to Davion Mitchell. That's like three assists maybe. And then Ryan Rupert. Now, the good thing about Rupert is we think he's going to start almost definitely. He can get three or four assists, but there is no assist upside. It's very hard to find a high assist upside player sitting on your waiver wire, basically in any league at this point. We go to steals. Javante Green right up the top there. Big minutes coming, most likely, I'm guessing. Pretty good defensive player. Same with Chemezi Metu. Now, of course, we know the story with steals. Metu started last game and got zero of them. And he had like four, three, and two in the three games prior. They come in bunches, and it is a small volume stat, and it becomes a situation where it's very easy to get zeros for three games in a row. Look at Herb Jones. But we have to put Metu up the top of this list. Keon Ellis, the same thing. Going to have six deals, going to have zero. But we love that upside. Dyson Daniels is a pretty good steals option. In fact, again, one of the big takeaways, I think, from playing through this end of the season is when we look at all this streaming specific for one category, there's always steals guys on the wire. Always. It's basically becoming closer to three-pointers in terms of why would I highly prioritize this in drafts when there's just so many steals options available. Got Delano Banton there again, who's a pretty good defensive stat accumulator. And then Chris Murray was able to generate some decent steals. He's done that a few times this season. It's always going to be iffy with him, but there's some interest there. And then we go to, lastly, free throw percentage, which is usually correlated to guards as well. So I've got the two rookies again, Keontae George and Scoot Henderson up the top. Then we go to Dylan Brooks, who's a pretty good free throw guy. Chimezi Metu has been excellent from the line this season. Bryce Sensible, even though his minutes have reduced, he can be a pretty good shooter from the line. And Marcus Sasser is also, I think, like a 90% free throw guy. Doesn't get there a lot, but likely a boosted role once more. With Cade likely injury managing, um, gives Sasser 
that extra opportunity. And that brings us to the end of the daily look ahead for Thursday with five games on. That's the last small one. We've got two more of these to go, and they're both 15 game days because why not? Hit the thumb, subscribe, ring the bell, and leave your old sexy comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.